Now, uh, so uh, why is it relevant to manage diabetes safely? We know that the diabetes is associated with several underlying conditions, comorbidities such as say, uh, cardiovascular disease, renal impairment, hepatic impairment, obesity. Uh, now, some of these comorbidities can uh, pose a hypoglycemia risk, but at the same time, you have to have a defective glycemic control to prevent uh, the complications of diabetes. And we know that hypoglycemia, which is a dreaded complication of diabetes, it is associated with greater likelihood of treatment discontinuation and, and which can lead to uh, further uh, economic burden. And recurrent hypoglycemia has also been associated with cognitive deficit in elderly. And it can also lead to repeated clinic visits leading to higher cost. And overall, there will be a de deterioration of uh, quality of life in patients. So uh, the agenda of my talk would be that why correct diabetes classification is important to prevent complications and take uh, safe treatment decisions how to initiate WAD safely in type two diabetes, what are the issues in elderly, and how to manage diabetes in case of CKD and CLD, and, uh, and uh, last but not the least, how to manage hypoglycemia, and how to adopt preventive strategies uh, for hypoglycemia. So the first case, my first case, uh, Ms. Shuniti, 42-year-old woman, has come with uncontrolled diabetes, fasting 382, PP467, HPMC 8.3%, uh, diabetes was detected two weeks back. He, she complains of severe osmotic symptoms, burning sensation during micturation. And she was started on glimepiride one milligram and metformin thousand milligram uh, by primary care physicians. Uh, her BMI is 22.3 kilogram per meter squared. There is no family history of diabetes. There are no features of insulin resistance. And, and at the present moment, uh, there is no dehydration tongue is moist, respiratory rate is regular, and she is able to uh, take feed orally. And urine ketones was done, and it was nil. And, 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 it, and the patient was started on basal bolus insulin in view of this clinical scenario. And later on, it was uh, C-peptide reserve testing was planned, and post-mix uh, meal 90-minute uh, C-peptide reserve testing showed that there is a significant decline in, in the C-peptide reserve. That's suggestive of type one diabetes. So, uh, what is what is the take home? What are the take home messages from this case? We have to we have to remind, we have to educate uh, our fellow uh, primary care physicians that not all cases of type one uh, diabetes have young onset and ketosis at diagnosis. And we at the same time we have to watch out for the latent autoimmune diabetes in adults. We have to screen for ketoacidosis when in doubt uh, for appropriate DKA protocol from the very beginning. And, and obviously for stamping the diagnosis of type one diabetes, you have to have a C-peptide reserve testing after achieving euglycemia. And also you, have, you need uh, insulin autoantibodies uh, uh, for uh, confirming. But if, if, you, if, you, if you have a C-peptide reserve testing uh, that is the low C-peptide, then you can say it, it is a type one diabetes in this current scenario. So the basal bolus insulin uh, is the mainly the gold standard in type one diabetes. And that has to be instituted from early on. And uh, metformin can be considered if there is coexistent insulin resistance. And another thing that is uh, very important that you have to watch out for hypoglycemia in the honeymoon phase of uh, type 1 diabetes when the insulin requirement decreases. So these are the take home messages from this case. And, and uh, we have to keep that in mind. Now, coming to my second case, uh, Mr. Bishwash, a uh, 25-year-old man, has come with suboptimal control of diabetes detected one year back. Uh, fasting is now 172, postprandial is 313. He was on therapy of glimepiride 2, metformin uh, uh, 1,500 milligram once daily, along with tenilipin 20 milligram. He has, ag again, no family history, no features of insulin resistance, and no abdominal imaging was also done. So now on ab one abdominal imaging was ordered, and now the stress extra abdomen reveals that, that there is radio dense particles in, along the pancreas. So the diagnosis was made that it is a case of fibrocapsulous pancreatic diabetes. Now, when we talk about FCBT, we generally picturize a lean young adult with pride of abdominal pain, hyaturia, diabetes, generally belonging to lower socioeconomic stratum. There are certain points that we have to keep in mind that the facts are that pain may not be a significant symptom in them, steatoria may not be there, and the presenting feature may be only diabetes. And it, 
FCBD has also been found in individuals belonging to more affluent classes. So all these things we have to keep in mind. So, uh, so correct diagnosis of diabetes uh, helps, can help us to take safe decisions uh, from the very beginning. In this case, teniliptine was ordered, but we know that it, it is generally uh, better to avoid DP4 inhibitor in pancreatogenic diabetes due to future risk of pancreatogenic carcinoma. And the therapy required mostly insulin. So the patient was uh, started on insulin premix and one voglibos petformin combination before lunch, and we were able to achieve glycemic control in that patient. Now coming to the case three, uh, we we often see that uh, uh, it is uh, uh, now the case three is Mr. Bishas, that 35 year old man who has sought a second opinion after being diagnosed with new onset type two diabetes. Uh, and at that present, uh, at, at that time, his fasting was 180, postprandial was 221, but he was starting on uh, oral hypoglycemics like glimepiride 1 milligram and metformin 500 milligram combination. And now he is complaining of dizziness, fasting bar sugar 67, postprandial uh, 81. Now uh, it is clearly seen that it, it, there was no need for sulfonylurea urea therapy as first line agent in this patient. Now, so the glimepiride uh, metformin combination was stopped. Patient was shifted to metformin 500 milligram once daily. This is also something that we, we see day to day. Uh, some, someone has started uh, on in new diabetes, new onset diabetes, someone has started sulfonylurea therapy, but it should not be done. So. It was only patient was only shifted to metformin 500 milligram once daily, and his after one month his fasting uh, blood glucose was 102, postprandial was 143. So the approach always should be to use the start low and go slow principle in initiating and increasing medication to adhere to the guidelines and monitor response after each type pressure. Now there are uh, there is one important aspect that I would like to hi highlight is that that if Metformin can cause often GI intolerance. So uh, if, if we find that with high doses, uh, there is GI intolerance, sometimes it is better uh, to try the sustained release form and to go very slow with, with uh, 500 milligram daily, once daily dose and then gradually build up. But still, if the patient complains of GI intolerance, it's better to uh, start with the B4 inhibitors or low dose sulfonylureas. Now, coming to the choice of second line, uh, if you if you if you take these important points in mind, like uh, obesity, CKD, duration of diabetes, established CBT. So, if a person who has all these factors, probably HDLGB2 comes uh, first line. Just, uh, but uh, regarding the GLP-1 agonist, if the patient is obese and established CBT, it becomes second line just because of the cost, because we have to take in account the economic economic issues of the patient also. And, and coming to the DPP-4 inhibitors, it is clearly uh, noted that DPP-4 inhibitors is a very attractive second line agent uh, when it comes to treat diabetes in elderly. And, and if you coming to the sulfonylureas and insulin, if the diabetes duration is very, uh, very uh, long and, and uh, you need to have a quick control, probably sulfonylurea uh, is a better choice. And, and if, if the patient has any underlying infection, it's better to go for uh, insulin therapy for quick control of diabetes. So these are the uh, choice of second line agents we have to keep in mind. And coming to the uh, next topic, that is the diabetes in elderly. What are the issues uh, of diabetes in elderly? We know that the type two diabetes is an age related disease with a prevalence of 33% in US population, ages 65 years or older. And nearly 50% of older people meet the criteria of pre-diabetes in US population. Now the diabetic uh, uh, in elderly has a distinct pathophysiology because elderly patients often have increased adiposity, decreased muscle mass, and uh, uh, also because of the sedentary lifestyle, they, uh, they have this high risk of diabetes. And some of them may have a decreased response to increasing also. And, uh, Apart from this, there are also safety concerns related to hypoglycemia in elderly. Uh, elderly patients may have impaired counter-regulatory adrenaline response to hypoglycemia, and so they may have impaired glucagon reserve as well. So all these factors taken together emphasize the need for uh, special attention, attention 
uh, to treat diabetes in elderly. So coming to the management strategies, what should be the treatment goals in elderly diabetic? So if the, if the patient is healthy, a reasonable evidence goal of 7 to 7.5 percent or maybe less than 7 percent may be uh, targeted uh, without any risk of hypoglycemia. Now, if the patients have multiple comorbidities, patient is frail, then it is it is reasonable to have a relaxed HBC target that is eight percent. And and if the patient has some end stage chronic illnesses uh, like end stage chronic kidney disease, and there is a risk of severe hypoglycemia, there is history of recurrent hypoglycemia, then sometimes HBC may be relaxed up to eight point five percent. And in those cases, blood pressure target should also be relaxed, like 150 by 90. And uh, coming to the statin treatment, we have to consider likelihood of benefit of statin uh, in those patients. Uh, like if, if the patients have end-stage kidney disease, then uh, if the patient is not on statin, the probably statin should not be, I mean, statin should not be initiated because there is very minimal risk of mort uh, mortality benefit, minimal or mortality benefit with statins in those patients. So coming to the management strategies in elderly, we as clinicians have to screen them for mild cognitive dysfunction to determine if those patients are able to perform cell care tasks and if they are able to monitor and respond to hypoglycemia. We may also perform, we should also perform functional testing like hearing, uh, uh, vision loss, uh, frailty assessment, to determine whether patients are physically able to respond appropriately to hypoglycemia. And, and coming to the dietary adherence, it has been shown in studies that approximately 40% of older adults do not meet the recommended 0.8 gram per kg body intake. So for them, we need to have a dietary guideline. We have to educate them. We have to educate their caregivers so that they can adhere to the, this recommended protein intake. And, and, and last but not the least, we have to identify caregivers, we have to educate them, and we have to, we have to simplify the treatment regimen uh, so that they can adhere to that simplified treatment regimen. And uh, coming to the hypoglycemia rates, as I have already said that those patients may not uh, have some adrenergic, uh, adrenergic response to hypoglycemia, they may not show those autonomic symptoms uh, like in elderly diabetic, uh, like in uh, young diabetics. So we, we, we should not rely upon signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia, which may be absent in this population. So coming to the choice of agents in elderly, coming to the sulfonyl ureas, they are very notorious for hypoglycemia. So we have to watch out for hypoglycemia. Now coming to the another agents like SGLT2 inhibitors, they can offer good glycemic control. They can, uh, they can cause reduction in the severe risks. But when it comes to the tolerability profile, they may cause increased uh, immunized tract infection, genital mycotic infection, and particularly elderly frail uh, individuals may be more prone to hypovolemia, dehydration, and postural hypotension. So in those patients, SGLT2 inhibitors should be avoided. So so for those patients, as a second line agent, DPP-4 inhibitors is a very efficacious, safe agent with minimal tolerability issue. And particularly, if we, if we consider linagiptin, once daily dosing with no risk of hypoglycemia and no need for a dose adjustment in chronic kidney disease makes linagiptin an attractive second line agent for use in elderly. Now, if we need uh, insulin, for intensification, then probably uh, basal insulin analog should be preferred. Uh, however, even in those cases, we have to watch out for hypoglycemia. And glitazones generally are, uh, glitazone use is generally restricted because of the weight gain, fluid reduction side effects, and of, of course, uh, osteoporosis in postmenopausal women. So coming to the managing uh, diabetes in CKD, uh, what should be the glycemic targets? The ideal target which is around 7%. However, it should be relaxed if, if there is a history of severe hypoglycemia, limited life expectancy, health monitoring of blood glucose should be advised. And we have to keep in mind certain facts about HB1C because uh, carbohydrate hemoglobin, iron deficiency, metabolic acidosis, uh, may cause falsely elevated H1C. So we should not 
uh, we should be very cautious while targeting age beyond C. Uh, for those patients, we have to rely more on the self-monitoring of blood glucose and fasting and postprandial blood glucose. And now coming to the uh, management part, insulin regimens commonly used, particularly when the weight is failed and easy to adjust. And there is no specific contraindication of insulin regimen type. And we have to avoid hypoglycemia with individualized doses. Uh, so any insulin regimen can be used only, uh, provided that there is no hypoglycemia. And if, if, however, if there is a high risk of fasting hypoglycemia, it is better to avoid basal insulin. In some patients with advanced CKD, we often find that the prandial uh, rapid acting insulin suffices uh, for optimum glycemic management due to increased half-life of insulin in them. And self-monitoring of blood glucose, as I have uh, already told, it, it should be done accordingly. So coming to the agents, we all know that metformin, we have to reduce the dose if the AGFR is 30 to 45. And we can cautiously use in, in EGFR 45 to 60 group. And however, we have to stop metformin if EGFR goes below 30. With bioglitazone, generally there is limited use due to fluid retention, anemia, and risk of osteoporosis. Repaglinide can be used uh, in CKD stage one to three. Glucosidase inhibitors is, are generally contraindicated in renal failure. Now coming to the sulfonylureas, lumipiride can be used uh, to, in, if, if the EGFR is uh, more than 30. Uh, however, it should be cautiously used because it can cause hypoglycemia and uh, when comparing lumipiride with liclazide, probably liclazide has a lower hypoglycemia risk. And uh, liclazide, uh, however, it is better to avoid uh, liclazide if the EGFR goes below 30. And coming to the glipizide, generally no dose adjustment is needed. Uh, however, still it, is, uh, it, it can cause risk of uh, hypoglycemia. So it is better to avoid if EGFR goes down below 30. So, uh, uh, the experience with glucoside, as I have already told, there is there were in guide study there were significantly lower risks of confirmed hypoglycemia with glucoside as compared to glimepiride, and uh, probably it is because of the fact that glucoside is the only sulfonylurea reported not to bind to EPAC2, uh, which is a stimulating factor for insulin exercises and release. Now coming to the managing management with DPV4 inhibitors part. Uh, we can clearly see that cetagliptin, hilagliptin, all these gliptins require dose adjustment when EGFR goes uh, below uh, 30, uh, 60. But in case of linagliptin, in, in, in moderate and severe uh, uh, renal infarction, linagliptin uh, it does not require any dose adjustment. So it is because of the fact that the linagliptin is generally minimally metabolized and it has a primary biliary excretion. Whereas coming to cetagliptin, it is minimally metabolized, but it has primary renal excretion. So this explains why linagliptin does not require any dose adjustment uh, in chronic kidney disease. Now, if we look at the glycemic efficacy of linagliptin, which is, uh, which is important to note that it, it can lower hb one effectively in patients with different stages of renal impairment. So in the EGFR less than 30 and in 30 to 50 group, it has clearly been shown that linagliptin therapy can improve HbA1c. And coming to the hypoglycemia risk, obviously I have already told that linagliptin is uh, associated with minimal risk of hypoglycemia. So in these studies as well, that uh, it has been shown that linagliptin provided clinically minimal improvement in glycemic control with very low risk of severe hypoglycemia. And another important study that I would like to mention uh, if, if the patient is on insulin along with linagliptin, linagliptin can also permit the reduction of insulin dose in patients with severe renal impairment over 52 weeks. And, and, and coming to the renal outcomes of linagliptin, the Marlina outcome trial, it clearly showed that, that linagliptin might have some renoproductive effect because the surrogate endpoints of albuminuria progression was decreased with dinagiptin therapy in Marlina renal outcomes trial. However, the mean EGFR did not change. Now, uh, the albumin blurring by linagiptin uh, was found to be independent of improvement in glucose in this study, which is a very important point to note. 
So coming to one post-hoc analysis uh, of Malina T2 trial, they showed that participants treated with nilagiptin were 70% more likely to achieve a meaningful response, more than 20% decrease in urine ACR at week 24 relative to baseline than to show no response. So clearly there was a renoprotective effect. So what are the proposed renoprotective mechanisms from, from all these uh, studies? The proposed renoprotective mechanisms are that they may have an antioxidant effect. And in some cases, it was found that DPP4X may be overexpressed in patients with diabetic nephropathy. So DPP4 inhibition may improve the mitochondrial dysfunction and improve overall endothelial dysfunction leading to the neuroprotection and microalbuminia reduction. So if we look at the renal outcomes with Carmelina, although the EGFR, uh, although the expiratory kidney outcome like the sustained ESRD dead due to kidney failure and sustained decrease of more than 50% in EGFR from baseline, this, this particular uh, outcome was not decreased with nagiptin compared to placebo, but albuminia progression was significantly decreased with nagiptin therapy. And we know that albuminuria is a cardiovascular risk factor. So if we can uh, halt the albuminuria progression, so nagiptin might have some uh, long-term impact in, in terms of cardiovascular risk reduction. However, coming to the HGLT2 inhibitors, now, SGLT2 inhibitors, if we look at the renoprotection uh, potential of SGLT2 inhibitors, they clearly show that if we look at the DAPA CKD credence trial, they clearly show that there is a significant benefit with EGFR decline as well. And also there are significant benefits on hospitalization due to heart failure in patients with CKD. So, so, so with the advent of SGLT2 inhibitors, where uh, do DPP4 inhibitors stand? Uh, we have already shown that the studies on DPP4 inhibitors mostly demonstrate safety rather than true efficacy in contrast to SGLT2 inhibitors. And uh, studies on DPP4 inhibitors indeed showed improvement in surrogate endpoints such as microalbuminuria. And this microalbuminuria reduction may have some long term meaningful effect in terms of cardiovascular risk reduction. However, it has to be kept in mind that SGLT2 inhibitors have some tolerability issues, particularly in elderly individuals. So DPE4 inhibitors have the age over uh, SGLT2 inhibitors, particularly in those patients, and they are safe to use at any stage of CKD, and they have beneficial effects of glucose control without inducing hypoglycemia or, or, or risk of postural hypotension or uh, dehydration in elderly individuals. And last but not the least, it, it has to be kept in mind that adding DV4 inhibitor to HGL2 inhibitor may be associated, was associated with lower incidence of urinary tract infections in few studies. So this combination may also be helpful. So if you have some patient who is already on HG2 elevators, a linagiptin, uh, uh, addition of linagiptin or DV4 inhibitor may help. So coming to the, uh, this case for uh, 60 year old female attendant uh, who has a history of recurrent UTI, uh, who is on atorvastatin 40, levothyroxine 50, aspirin 75 milligram, metformin one gram. His BM, uh, he, her BMI is 30, A1C is 8.4%, fasting is 148, postprandial is 230, and EGFR is 37.6. Now, ECG shows a, is evidence of old inter, interior wall myocardial infarction. So which anti-diabetic agent to add as second line to metformin in this patient? Now, if we look, if we, if we, if we take the holistic approach, first question should be that what should be his glycemic target? Like this patient was 60 years old, diabetes duration was seven years, and the patient had CKD, old inferior wall myocardial depression was there. So very intensive control may not be required. And hypoglycemia history also has to be kept in mind. And so, so cho choosing one second line agent has to be, uh, has to have an holistic approach. We have to keep in mind the risk of hypoglycemia and CKD, risk of weight gain since the patient has already a BMI of 30. And we also need, need to have some 
OAD, which can offer you know, protection and CV safety. However, we are also have to consider potential side effects of oral anti-diabetic agents. So in this case, uh, basically ninagiptin was added as really to inhibitors was not added in view of uh, uh, history of recurrent urinary tract infection. And you can clearly see that with addition of linagiptin after one month, glycemic uh, status was optimal. Now, coming to the next important topic, how Dr. to manage Wendell, diabetes. You have a couple of minutes to wind up, please. Okay, okay, uh, okay, sir. So insulin regimens often used in decompensated cirrhosis, uh, and we have to watch out for hypoglycemia. Metformin has been safely used uh, with survival benefits. However, we have to avoid in case of alcoholism and coexistent renal dysfunction. Pyoglidazone has been used in NASH, but it is better to avoid uh, in childhood BC cirrhosis. However, it is important to note that pyoglidazone did not show any benefits on disease progression in NASH. And uh, coming to the SGLT2 inhibitors, they may be used cautiously for childhood A, B cirrhosis without dose adjustment. However, in patients who have coexistent renal dysfunction, probably it is better to avoid those agents because of a risk of hepatorenal syndrome. Now, coming to the DP4 inhibitors, they may offer a safe, effective therapy in uh, CLD. In fact, uh, mild, moderate, and severe hepatic impairment did not result in increase in lenagiptin exposure after single and multiple dosing compared with normal hepatic function. Now, coming to the last case, I have uh, five or six slides. Now, this 78-year-old man came with nausea, generalized weakness. The patient was on MSI along with uh, metformin and dapaglifosin 10 milligram. Now, self-monitoring blood glucose revealed frequent hypoglycemia, and however, the patient informed us that he had to add symptoms during these hypoglycemic episodes. Now, the patient uh, was admitted uh, in, in view of dehydration, and the, and the pH has came out to 7.2, and a diagnosis of glycemic decay was made. Now, coming to the concerns uh, with a GLT2 inhibitor for this patient, uh, the patient was 78 years old. The patient was on MSI, and 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 the patient was a, had a history of unhealed diabetic foot ulcer. So, so keeping all these things in mind, that you, it it is better to discontinue if there is any signs of active infection uh, in, in in an elderly patient because of uh, this uh, catabolic state and and risk of ketosis. And uh, importantly, it is better to avoid uh, HLT2 inhibitors in elderly longstanding type 2 diabetes because of risk of euglycemic decay if, if you have insulin deficiency state. And very old patients uh, are often prone to risk of dehydration and postural hypotension, and that may increase falls and long, long bone fractures, uh, leading to increased mortality. So for those patients, it's very HLT2 inhibitors should be avoided. And like in this case, SGLT2 inhibitor probably uh, uh, led to euglycemic decay uh, for this patient. And the, another important factor in this patient was hypoglycemia uh, unawareness. And, and, and that's why we recommended a reduction in both his insulin, glargine, and aspart. And we emphasized the risk of uh, relative safety of three weeks of mild hyperglycemia to restore autonomic symptoms in this patient. So hypo Coming to the hypoglycemia, I'm not going into the details of treatment of hypoglycemia. We all know that. Now, coming to the strategies to prevent, if there is isn't one episode, we have to adjust the sulfonylurea and insulin dose, probably avoid repaglinide also. And we have to consider alternate treatment with minimal risk of hypoglycemia. We have to remind patient to carry enough carbohydrate with them. We have to advise them to perform SMBG and wait for euglycemia before engaging in activities uh, like exercise and driving, childcare, et cetera. And coming to the hypoglycemia unawareness, which may lead to severe hypoglycemia and increased mortality, we have to strictly avoid hypoglycemia for at least two to three weeks. And for some patients with brittle diabetes, for many patients with brittle diabetes, CGM is an effective tool. Now, uh, coming to other strategies to prevent uh, unplanned meal, alcohol ingestion, using multiple medication, 
like poly uh, polypharmacy and associated comorbidities has to be kept in mind. If you, if, if particularly for type 1 diabetes patients, if the patient uh, plans an exercise, we have to reduce the rapid acting insulin bolus dose before exercise, and we have to advise SMBG before and after exercise to avoid hypoglycemia in those patients. And there are several medications which may lead to hypoglycemia, like warfarin, salicylates, some beta blockers, and allopurinol. Uh, so those agents, if the patient are already uh, on those agents, we have to keep that in mind. So last but not the least, we have to follow a structured patient education program for improvement in active patient involvement. We have to establish, maintain communication with the patient. We have to educate the patient for self-management of the condition. And we have to inform the patient on treatment plan, diet modification. Uh, so that's how we can ma manage the uh, diabetes safely. So to conclude, correct diagnosis of diabetes type is important uh, for safe decisions from the very beginning. For type 2 diabetes management, you have to start low and go slow. Uh, in the same time, you have to avoid insulin inertia when there is a need for intensification. Treatment goals and therapies have to be individualized depending on age, functional status, comorbidities, and risk of hypoglycemia. Elderly diabetes need special attention. We need to screen them for cognitive dysfunction, functional impairment, and Self-monitoring of blood glucose is a very important access for patients with recurrent hypoglycemia, and conventional risk factors need to be addressed through structured patient education. Thank you. Thank you, Monak. You have done a wonderful job. Uh, diabetes, diagnosis to management, 360 degree in a presentation. Uh, yeah, there was a, uh, uh, one single question which you have already answered with your last case, how to deal with CLD when it comes to brittle diabetes. Uh, I, I think we all do agree. There was another question on uh, whether in CLD in child park C, what would be the drug of choice? I would want you to address that uh, briskly. Child bug C, CLD. It's better to avoid any oral anti-diabetic agent in child bug C, and insulin remains the safest agent to use in case of child bug C uh, chronic liver disease. Thank you. Thank you so very much. And